Because of the Dollars A story by Joseph Conrad Chapter 1 While we were hanging about near the water's edge, as sailors idling ashore will do, it was in the open space before the harbour office of a great eastern port. A man came towards us from the front of business houses, aiming obliquely at the landing steps. He attracted my attention because in the movement of figures in white drill suits on the pavement from which he stepped, his costume, the usual tunic and trousers, being made of light grey flannel, made him noticeable. I had time to observe him. He was stout, but he was not grotesque. His face was round and smooth, his complexion very fair. On his nearer approach I saw a little moustache, made all the fairer by a good many white hairs. And he had, for a stout man, quite a good chin. In passing us he exchanged nods with the friend I was with and smiled. My friend was Hollis, the fellow who had so many adventures and had known so many queer people in that part of the uh, more or less gorgeous East in the days of his youth. He said, That's a good man. I don't mean good in the sense of smart or skilful in his trade. I mean a really good man. I turned round at once to look at the phenomenon. The really good man had a very broad back. I saw him signal a sampan to come alongside, get into it, and go off in the direction of a cluster of local steamers anchored close in shore. I said, he's a seaman, isn't he? Yes, commands that biggish dark green steamer, Sissy, Glasgow. He has never commanded anything else but the Sissy, Glasgow. Only it wasn't always the same Sissy. The first he had was about half the length of this one, and we used to tell poor Davidson that she was a size too small for him. Even at that time, Davidson had bulk. We warned him he would get callosities on his shoulders and elbows because of the tight fit of his command, and Davidson could well afford the smiles he gave us for our chaff. He made lots of money in her. She belonged to a portly Chinaman resembling a Mandarin in a picture book, with goggles and thin drooping moustaches and as dignified as only a celestial knows how to be. The best of Chinamen as employers is that they have such gentlemanly instincts. Once they become convinced that you are a straight man, they give you their unbounded confidence. You simply can't do wrong then. And they are pretty quick judges of character too. Davidson's Chinaman was the first to find out his worth. On some theoretical principle, one day in his counting house, before several white men, he was heard to declare, Captain Davidson is a good man. And that settled it. After that, you couldn't tell if it was Davidson who belonged to the Chinaman, or the Chinaman who belonged to Davidson. It was he who, shortly before he died, ordered in Glasgow the new sissy for Davidson to command. We walked into the shade of the harbour office and leaned our elbows on the parapet of the quay. She was really meant to comfort poor Davidson, continued Hollis. Can you fancy anything more naively touching than this old Mandarin spending several thousand pounds to console his white man? Well, there she is. The old Mandarin's sons have inherited her, and Davidson with her, and he commands her, and what with his salary and trading privileges, he makes a lot of money, and everything is as before, and Davidson even smiles. You have seen it? Well, the smile's the only thing which isn't as before. Tell me, Hollis, I asked, what do you mean by good in this connection? Well, there are men who are born good just as others are born witty. What I mean is his nature. No simpler, more scrupulously delicate soul had ever lived in such a comfortable envelope. How we used to laugh at Davidson's fine scruples. In short, he's thoroughly humane, and I don't imagine there can be much of any other sort of goodness that counts on this earth. And as he's that with a shade of particular refinement, I may well call him a really good man. I knew from old that Hollis was a firm believer in the final value of shades. And I said, I see. Because I really did see Hollis's Davidson in the sympathetic stout man who had passed us a little while before. But I remembered that at the very moment he smiled, his placid face appeared veiled in melancholy, a sort of spiritual shadow. I went on. Who on earth has paid him off for being so fine by spoiling his smile? That's quite a story, and I will tell it to you if you like. Confound it. It's quite a surprising one, too. Surprising in every way, 
but mostly in the way it knocked over poor Davidson, and apparently only because he is such a good sort. He was telling me all about it only a few days ago. He said that when he saw these four fellows with their heads in a bunch over the table, he at once didn't like it. He didn't like it at all. You mustn't suppose that Davidson is a soft fool. These men... But I had better begin at the beginning. We must go back to the first time the old dollars had been called in by our government in exchange for a new issue, just about the time when I left these parts to go home for a long stay. Every trader in the islands was thinking of getting his old dollars sent up here in time, and the demand for empty French wine cases, you know the dozen of vermouth or claret size, was something unprecedented. The custom was to pack the dollars in little bags of a hundred each. I don't know how many bags each case would hold. A good lot. Pretty tidy sums must have been moving afloat just then. But let us get away from here. Won't do to stay in the sun. Where could we... I know. Let us go to those tiffin rooms over there. We moved over accordingly. Our appearance in the long empty room at that early hour caused visible consternation amongst the China boys. But Hollis led the way to one of the tables between the windows screened by rattan blinds. A brilliant half-light trembled on the ceiling. On the whitewashed walls bathed the multitude of vacant chairs and tables in a peculiar, stealthy glow. All right, we will get something to eat when it's ready, he said, waving the anxious Chinaman waiter aside. He took his temples touched with grey between his hands, leaning over the table to bring his face, his dark, keen eyes, closer to mine. Davidson then was commanding the steamer Sissy, the little one which we used to chaff him about. He ran her alone, with only the Malay Sarang for a deck officer. The nearest approach to another white man on board of her was the engineer, a Portuguese half-caste, as thin as a lath and quite a youngster at that. For all practical purposes, Davidson was managing that command of his single-handed, and of course, this was known in the port. I am telling you of it because the fact had its influence on the developments you shall hear of presently. His steamer, being so small, could go up tiny creeks and into shallow bays and through reefs and over sandbanks, collecting produce where no other vessel but a native craft would think of venturing. It is a paying game, often. Davidson was known to visit in her places that no one else could find and that hardly anybody had ever heard of. The old dollars being called in, Davidson's Chinaman thought that the sissy would be just the thing to collect them from small traders in the less frequented parts of the archipelago. It's a good business. Such cases of dollars are dumped aft in the ship's lazarette, and you get good freight for very little trouble and space. Davidson, too, thought it was a good idea, and together they made up a list of his calls on his next trip. Then Davidson, he had naturally the chart of his voyages in his head, remarked that on his way back he might look in at a certain settlement up a mere creek, where a poor sort of white man lived in a native village. Davidson pointed out to his Chinaman that the fellow was certain to have some rattans to ship. Probably enough to fill her forward, said Davidson, and that'll be better than bringing her back with empty holds. A day more or less doesn't matter. This was sound talk, and the Chinaman owner could not but agree. But if it hadn't been sound, it would have been just the same. Davidson did what he liked. He was a man that could do no wrong. However, this suggestion of his was not merely a business matter. There was in it a touch of Davidsonian kindness. For you must know that the man could not have continued to live quietly up that creek if it had not been for Davidson's willingness to call there from time to time and Davidson's Chinaman knew this perfectly well, too. So he only smiled his dignified, bland smile and said, All right, Captain, you do what you like. I will explain presently how this connection between Davidson and that fellow came about. Now I want to tell you about the part of this affair which happened here, the preliminaries of it. You know as well as I do that these tiffin rooms where we are sitting now have been in existence for many years. Well, next day, about twelve o'clock, Davidson dropped in here to get something to eat. And here comes the only moment in this story where accident, mere accident, plays a part. If Davidson had gone home that day for tiffin, there would be now 
after twelve years or more, nothing changed in his kindly, placid smile. But he came in here, and perhaps it was sitting at this very table that he remarked to a friend of mine that his next trip was to be a dollar-collecting trip. He added, laughing, that his wife was making rather a fuss about it. She had begged him to stay ashore and get somebody else to take his place for a voyage. She thought there was some danger on account of the dollars. He told her, he said, that there were no Java Sea pirates nowadays except in boys' books. He had laughed at her fears, but he was very sorry too, for when she took any notion in her head, it was impossible to argue her out of it. She would be worrying herself all the time he was away. Well, he couldn't help it. There was no one ashore fit to take his place for the trip. This friend of mine and I went home together in the same mailboat, and he mentioned that conversation one evening in the Red Sea while we were talking over the things and people we had just left, with more or less regret. I can't say that Davidson occupied a very prominent place. Moral excellence seldom does. He was quietly appreciated by those who knew him well. But his more obvious distinction consisted in this, that he was married. Ours, as you remember, was a bachelor crowd. In spirit anyhow, if not absolutely in fact. There might have been a few wives in existence, but if so, they were invisible, distant, never alluded to. For what would have been the good? Davidson alone was visibly married. Being married suited him exactly. It fitted him so well that the wildest of us did not resent the fact when it was disclosed. Directly he had felt his feet out here, Davidson sent for his wife. She came out, from West Australia, in the Somerset, under the care of Captain Ritchie. You know, Monkey Face Ritchie, who couldn't praise enough her sweetness, her gentleness, and her charm. She seemed to be the heaven-born mate for Davidson. She found on arrival a very pretty bungalow on the hill, ready for her and the little girl they had. Very soon he got for her a two-wheeled trap and a Burma pony, and she used to drive down of an evening to pick up Davidson on the quay. When Davidson, beaming, got into the trap, it would become very full all at once. We used to admire Mrs. Davidson from a distance. It was a girlish head out of a keepsake. From a distance, we had not many opportunities for a closer view because she did not care to give them to us. We would have been glad to drop in at the Davidson bungalow, but we were made to feel somehow that we were not very welcome there. Not that she ever said anything ungracious. She never had much to say for herself. I was perhaps the one who saw most of the Davidsons at home. What I noticed under the superficial aspect of vapid sweetness was her convex, obstinate forehead and her small, red, pretty, ungenerous mouth. But then, I am an observer with strong prejudices. Most of us were fetched by her white, swan-like neck, by that drooping, innocent profile. There was a lot of latent devotion to Davidson's wife hereabouts at that time, I can tell you. But my idea was that she repaid it by a profound suspicion of the sort of men we were. A mistrust which extended, I fancied, to her very husband at times. And I thought then she was jealous of him in a way. Though there were no women that she could be jealous about, she had no women's society. It's difficult for a shipmaster's wife unless there are other shipmasters' wives about. And there were none here then. I know that the dock manager's wife called on her but that was all. The fellows here formed the opinion that Mrs. Davidson was a meek, shy little thing. She looked it, I must say, and this opinion was so universal that the friend I have been telling you of remembered his conversation with Davidson simply because of the statement about Davidson's wife. He even wondered to me, fancy Mrs. Davidson making a fuss to that extent. She didn't seem to me the sort of woman that would know how to make a fuss about anything. I wondered too, but not so much. That bumpy forehead, eh? I had always suspected her of being silly, and I observed that Davidson must have been vexed by this display of wifely anxiety. My friend said, no, he seemed rather touched and distressed. There really was no one he could ask to relieve him, mainly because he intended to make a call in some godforsaken creek to look up a fellow of the name of Bums, who apparently had settled there. And again my friend wondered, tell me, he cried, what connection can there be between Davidson and such a creature as Bamps? 
I don't remember now what answer I made. A sufficient one could have been given in two words, Davidson's goodness. That never boggled at unworthiness if there was the slightest reason for compassion. I don't want you to think that Davidson had no discrimination at all. Bamps could not have imposed on him. Moreover, everybody knew what Bamps was. He was a loafer with a beard. When I think of Bamps, the first thing I see is that long black beard and a lot of propitiatory wrinkles at the corners of two little eyes. There was no such beard from here to Polynesia, where a beard is a valuable property in itself. Bamps's beard was valuable to him in another way. You know how impressed Orientals are by a fine beard. Years and years ago, I remember the grave Abdullah, the great trader of Sambir, unable to repress signs of astonishment and admiration at the first sight of that imposing beard. And it's very well known that Bamps lived on Abdullah off and on for several years. It was a unique beard, and so was the bearer of the same, a unique loafer. He made a fine art of it, or rather a sort of craft and mystery. One can understand a fellow living by cadging and small swindles in towns, in large communities of people, but Bamps managed to do that trick in the wilderness, to loaf on the outskirts of the virgin forest. He understood how to ingratiate himself with the natives. He would arrive in some settlement up a river, make a present of a cheap carbine or a pair of shoddy binoculars or something of that sort to the Raja or the headman or the principal trader and on the strength of that gift ask for a house posing mysteriously as a very special trader. He would spin them no end of yarns, live on the fat of the land for a while and then do some mean swindle or other or else they would get tired of him and ask him to quit. And he would go off meekly with an air of injured innocence. Funny life. Yet, he never got hurt somehow. I've heard of the Raja of Dongola giving him fifty dollars worth of trade goods and paying his passage in a prow only to get rid of him. Fact. And observe that nothing prevented the old fellow having Bamps's throat cut and the carcass thrown into deep water outside the reefs. For who on earth would have inquired after Bamps? He had been known to loaf up and down the wilderness as far north as the Gulf of Tonkin. Neither did he disdain a spell of civilization from time to time, and it was while loafing and cadging in Saigon, bearded and dignified, he gave himself out there as a bookkeeper, that he came across laughing Anne. The less said of her early history, the better, but something must be said. We may safely suppose there was very little heart left in her famous laugh when Bamps spoke first to her in some low café. She was stranded in Saigon with precious little money and in great trouble about a kid she had, a boy of five or six. A fellow I just remember, whom they called Perla Harry, brought her out first into these parts, from Australia, I believe. He brought her out and then dropped her, and she remained knocking about here and there, known to most of us by sight at any rate. Everybody in the archipelago had heard of Laughing Anne. She had really a pleasant silvery laugh, always at her disposal, so to speak. But it wasn't enough, apparently, to make her fortune. The poor creature was ready to stick to any half-decent man, if he would only let her. But she always got dropped, as it might have been expected. She had been left in Saigon by the skipper of a German ship, with whom she had been going up and down the China coast as far as Vladivostok, for near upon two years. The German said to her, This is all over, mein Tobchen. I am going home now to get married to the girl I got engaged to before coming out here. And Anne said, All right, I'm ready to go. We part friends, don't we? She was always anxious to part friends. The German told her that of course they were parting friends. He looked rather glum at the moment of parting. She laughed and went ashore. But it was no laughing matter for her. She had some notion that this would be her last chance. What frightened her most was the future of her child. She had left her boy in Saigon before going off with the German, in the care of an elderly French couple. The husband was a doorkeeper in some government office, but his time was up, and they were returning to France. She had to take the boy back from them, and after she had got him back, she did not like to part with him any more. That was the situation when she and Bamps got acquainted casually. 
She could not have had any illusions about that fellow. To pick up with Bamps was coming down pretty low in the world, even from a material point of view. She had always been decent, in her way, whereas Bamps was, not to mince words, an abject sort of creature. On the other hand, that bearded loafer, who looked much more like a pirate than a bookkeeper, was not a brute. He was gentle, rather, even in his cups. And then despair, like misfortune, makes us acquainted with strange bedfellows. For she may well have despaired. She was no longer young, you know. On the man's side, this conjunction is more difficult to explain, perhaps. One thing, however, must be said of Bamts. He had always kept clear of native women. As one can't suspect him of moral delicacy, I surmise that it must have been from prudence. And he, too, was no longer young. There were many white hairs in his valuable black beard by then. He may have simply longed for some kind of companionship in his queer, degraded existence. Whatever their motives, they vanished from Saigon together. And of course, nobody cared what had become of them. Six months later, Davidson came into the Mirror Settlement. It was the very first time he had been up that creek, where no European vessel had ever been seen before. A Javanese passenger he had on board offered him $50 to call in there. It must have been some very particular business, and Davidson consented to try. $50, he told me, were neither here nor there, but he was curious to see the place, and the little sissy could go anywhere where there was water enough to float a soup plate. Davidson landed his Javanese plutocrat, and as he had to wait a couple of hours for the tide, he went ashore himself to stretch his legs. It was a small settlement, some sixty houses, most of them built on piles over the river, the rest scattered in the long grass, the usual pathway at the back, the forest hemming in the clearing and smothering what there might have been of air into a dead hot stagnation. All the population was on the riverbank, staring silently, as Malays will do, at the sissy anchored in the stream. She was almost as wonderful to them as an angel's visit. Many of the old people had only heard vaguely of fire ships, and not many of the younger generation had seen one. On the back path, Davidson strolled in perfect solitude, but he became aware of a bad smell and concluded he would go no farther. While he stood wiping his forehead, he heard from somewhere the exclamation, My God, it's Davy! Davidson's lower jaw, as he expressed it, came unhooked at the crying of this excited voice. Davy was the name used by the associates of his young days. He hadn't heard it for many years. He stared about with his mouth open and saw a white woman issue from the long grass in which a small hut stood buried nearly up to the roof. Try to imagine the shock. In that wild place that you couldn't find on a map and more squalid than the most poverty-stricken Malay settlement had a right to be. This European woman coming swishing out of the long grass in a fanciful tea-gown thing, dingy pink satin, with a long train and frayed lace trimmings, her eyes like black coals in a pasty white face. Davidson thought that he was asleep, that he was delirious. From the offensive village mud hole, it was what Davidson had sniffed just before, a couple of filthy buffaloes uprose with loud snorts and lumbered off crashing through the bushes, panic-struck by this apparition. The woman came forward, her arms extended, and laid her hands on Davidson's shoulders, exclaiming, Why? You have hardly changed at all. The same good Davy. And she laughed a little wildly. This sound was to Davidson like a galvanic shock to a corpse. He started in every muscle. Laughing Anne, he said in an awestruck voice, All that's left of her, Davy, all that's left of her. Davidson looked up at the sky, but there was to be seen no balloon from which she could have fallen on that spot. When he brought his distracted gaze down, it rested on a child holding on with a brown little paw to the pink satin gown. He had run out of the grass after her. Had Davidson seen a real hobgoblin, his eyes could not have bulged more than at this small boy in a dirty white blouse and ragged knickers. He had a round head of tight chestnut curls, very sunburnt legs, a freckled face, and merry eyes. Admonished by his mother to greet the gentleman, he finished off Davidson by addressing him in French. Bonjour. Davidson, overcome, 
looked up at the woman in silence. She sent the child back to the hut, and when he had disappeared in the grass, she turned to Davidson, tried to speak. But after getting out the words, That's my Tony, burst into a long fit of crying. She had to lean on Davidson's shoulder. He, distressed in the goodness of his heart, stood rooted to the spot where she had come upon him. What a meeting, eh? Bamps had sent her out to see what white man it was who had landed, and she had recognised him from that time when Davidson, who had been pearling himself in his youth, had been associating with Harry the Pearler and others, the quietest of a rather rowdy set. Before Davidson retraced his steps to go on board the steamer, he had heard much of Laughing Anne's story and had even had an interview on the path with Bamps himself. She ran back to the hut to fetch him, and he came out lounging, with his hands in his pockets, with the detached, casual manner under which he concealed his propensity to cringe. Ya ay as eyes. He thought he would settle here permanently, with her. This with a nod at laughing Anne, who stood by, a haggard, tragically anxious figure, her black hair hanging over her shoulders. No more paint and dyes for me, Davy, she struck in, if only you will do what he wants you to do. You know that I was always ready to stand by my men, if they had only let me. Davidson had no doubt of her earnestness. It was of Bamps's good faith that he was not at all sure. Bamps wanted Davidson to promise to call at Mirror more or less regularly. He thought he saw an opening to do business with Rattans there. If only he could depend on some craft to bring out trading goods and take away his produce. I have a few dollars to make a start on. The people are all right. He had come there, where he was not known, in a native prow, and had managed with his sedate manner and the exactly right kind of yarn he knew how to tell to the natives, to ingratiate himself with the chief man. The Orang Kaya has given me that empty house there to live in as long as I will stay, added Bumps. Do it, Davy, cried the woman suddenly. Think of that poor kid. Seen him? Cute little customer, said the reformed loafer, in such a tone of interest as to surprise Davidson into a kindly glance. I certainly can do it, he declared. He thought of at first making some stipulation as to Bamps behaving decently to the woman, but his exaggerated delicacy and also the conviction that such a fellow's promises were worth nothing restrained him. Anne went a little distance down the path with him, talking anxiously. It's for the kid. How could I have kept him with me if I had to knock about in towns? Here he will never know that his mother was a painted woman. And this Bamps likes him. He's real fond of him. I suppose I ought to thank God for that. Davidson shuddered at any human creature being brought so low as to have to thank God for the favours or affection of a Bamps. And do you think that you can make out to live here? he asked gently. Can't I? You know I have always stuck to men through thick and thin till they had enough of me, and now look at me. But inside I am as I always was. I have acted on the square to them all, one after another. Only they do get tired somehow. Oh, Davy, Harry ought not to have cast me off. It was he that led me astray. Davidson mentioned to her that Harry the Perler had been dead now for some years. Perhaps she had heard. She made a sign that she had heard, and walked by the side of Davidson in silence, nearly to the bank. Then she told him that her meeting with him had brought back the old times to her mind. She had not cried for years. She was not a crying woman either. It was hearing herself called Laughing Anne that had started her sobbing like a fool. Harry was the only man she had loved, the others. She shrugged her shoulders but she prided herself on her loyalty to the successive partners of her dismal adventures. She had never played any tricks in her life. She was a pal worth having. But men did get tired. They did not understand women. She supposed it had to be. Davidson was attempting a veiled warning as to Bamps. But she interrupted him. She knew what men were. She knew what this man was like. But he had taken wonderfully to the kid. And Davidson desisted willingly saying to himself that surely poor laughing Anne could have no illusions by this time. She wrung his hand hard at parting. It's for the kid, Davy, it's for the kid. Isn't he a bright little chap? Chapter 2 
All this happened about two years before the day when Davidson, sitting in this very room, talked to my friend. You will see presently how this room can get full. Every seat will be occupied, and as you notice, the tables are set close, so that the backs of the chairs are almost touching. There is also a good deal of noisy talk here about one o'clock. I don't suppose Davidson was talking very loudly, but very likely he had to raise his voice across the table to my friend. And here accident, mere accident, put in its work by providing a pair of fine ears close behind Davidson's chair. It was ten to one against, the owner of the same having enough change in his pockets to get his tiff in here. But he had. Most likely had rooked somebody of a few dollars at cards overnight. He was a bright creature of the name of Fector, a spare, short, jumpy fellow with a red face and muddy eyes. He described himself as a journalist, as certain kind of women give themselves out as actresses in the dock of a police court. He used to introduce himself to strangers as a man with a mission to track out abuses and fight them whenever found. He would also hint that he was a martyr, and it's a fact that he had been kicked, horse-whipped, imprisoned, and hounded with ignominy out of pretty well every place between Ceylon and Shanghai, for a professional blackmailer. I suppose in that trade, you've got to have active wits and sharp ears. It's not likely that he overheard every word Davidson said about his dollar-collecting trip, but he heard enough to set his wits at work. He let Davidson go out, and then hastened away down to the native slums, to a sort of lodging house, kept in partnership by the usual sort of Portuguese and a very disreputable Chinaman. Macau Hotel, it was called, but it was mostly a gambling den that one used to warn fellows against. Perhaps you remember. There, the evening before, Fector had met a precious couple, a partnership even more queer than the Portuguese and the Chinaman. One of the two was Niklaus, you know. Why? the fellow with a tartar moustache and a yellow complexion, like a Mongolian, only that his eyes were set straight and his face was not so flat. One couldn't tell what breed he was, a nondescript beggar. From a certain angle, you would think a very bilious white man, and I dare say he was. He owned a Malay prow and called himself the Nakoda, as one would say, the captain. Aha, now you remember. He couldn't apparently speak any other European language than English, but he flew the Dutch flag on his prow. The other was the Frenchman without hands. Yes, the very same we used to know in 79 in Sydney, keeping a little tobacco shop at the lower end of George Street. You remember the huge carcass hunched up behind the counter, the big white face and the long black hair brushed back off a high forehead like a bard's. He was always trying to roll cigarettes on his knee with his stumps, telling endless yarns of Polynesia and whining and cursing in turn about Mon Malheur. His hands had been blown away by a dynamite cartridge while fishing in some lagoon. This accident, I believe, had made him more wicked than before, which is saying a good deal. He was always talking about resuming his activities some day, whatever they were if he could only get an intelligent companion. It was evident that the little shop was no field for his activities, and the sickly woman with her face tied up, who used to look in sometimes through the back door, was no companion for him. And, true enough, he vanished from Sydney before long, after some trouble with the excise fellows about his stock. Goods stolen out of a warehouse or something similar. He left the woman behind, but he must have secured some sort of companion. He could not have shifted for himself. But whom he went away with, and where, and what other companions he might have picked up afterwards, it is impossible to make the remotest guess about. Why exactly he came this way, I can't tell. Towards the end of my time here, we began to hear talk of a maimed Frenchman who had been seen here and there. But no one knew then that he had foregathered with Niklaus and lived in his prow. I dare say he put Niklaus up to a thing or two. Anyhow, it was a partnership. Niklaus was somewhat afraid of the Frenchman on account of his tempers, which were awful. He looked then like a devil. But a man without hands, unable to load or handle a weapon, can at best go for one only with his teeth. From that danger, Niklaus felt certain he could always defend himself. The couple were alone together, 
loafing in the common room of that infamous hotel when Fector turned up. After some beating about the bush, for he was doubtful how far he could trust these two, he repeated what he had overheard in the tiffin rooms. His tale did not have much success till he came to mention the creek and Bamts's name. Niklaus, sailing about like a native in a prow, was in his own words familiar with the locality. The huge Frenchman, walking up and down the room with his stumps in the pockets of his jacket, stopped short in surprise. Comment? Bamts. Bamts. He had run across him several times in his life. He exclaimed, Bamts, mais je ne connais que car. And he applied such a contemptuously indecent epithet to Bamps that when later he alluded to him as une chief, a mere rag, it sounded quite complimentary. We can do with him what we like, he asserted confidently. Oh yes, certainly we must hasten to pay a visit to that. Another awful descriptive epithet, quite unfit for repetition. Devil take me if we don't pull off a coup that will set us all up for a long time. He saw all that lot of dollars melted into bars and disposed of somewhere on the China coast. Of the escape after the coup, he never doubted. There was Niklaus's prow to manage that in. In his enthusiasm, he pulled his stumps out of his pockets and waved them about. Then, catching sight of them, as it were, he held them in front of his eyes, cursing and blaspheming and bewailing his misfortune and his helplessness, till Niklaus quieted him down. But it was his mind that planned out the affair, and it was his spirit which carried the other two on. Neither of them was of the bold buccaneer type, and Fechter, especially, had never in his adventurous life used other weapons than slander and lies. That very evening they departed on a visit to Bamts in Niklaus's prow, which had been lying, emptied of her cargo of coconuts, for a day or two under the canal bridge. They must have crossed the bows of the anchored sissy, and no doubt looked at her with interest as the scene of their future exploit, the great hall, le grand coup. Davidson's wife, to his great surprise, sulked with him for several days before he left. I don't know whether it occurred to him that, for all her angelic profile, she was a very stupidly obstinate girl. She didn't like the tropics. He had brought her out there, where she had no friends, and now she said he was becoming inconsiderate. She had a presentiment of some misfortune, and notwithstanding Davidson's painstaking explanations, she could not see why her presentiments were to be disregarded. On the very last evening before Davidson went away, she asked him in a suspicious manner, Why is it that you are so anxious to go this time? I am not anxious, protested the good Davidson. I simply can't help myself. There's no one else to go in my place. Oh, there's no one she said, turning away slowly. She was so distant with him that evening that Davidson, from a sense of delicacy, made up his mind to say goodbye to her at once and go and sleep on board. He felt very miserable, and strangely enough, more on his own account than on account of his wife. She seemed to him much more offended than grieved. Three weeks later, having collected a good many cases of old dollars, they were stowed aft in the lazarette with an iron bar and a padlock securing the hatch under his cabin table, yes, with a bigger lot than he had expected to collect, he found himself homeward bound and off the entrance of the creek where Bamps lived, and even, in a sense, flourished. It was so late in the day that Davidson actually hesitated whether he should not pass by this time. He had no regard for Bamps, who was a degraded but not a really unhappy man. His pity for laughing Anne was no more than her case deserved but his goodness was of a particularly delicate sort. He realised how these people were dependent on him and how they would feel their dependence, if he failed to turn up, through a long month of anxious waiting. Prompted by his sensitive humanity, Davidson, in the gathering dusk, turned the sissy's head towards the hardly discernible coast and navigated her safety through a maze of shallow patches. But by the time he got to the mouth of the creek, the night had come. The narrow waterway lay like a black cutting through the forest, and as there were always grounded snags in the channel which it would be impossible to make out, Davidson very prudently turned the sissy round, and with only enough steam on the boilers to give her a touch ahead if necessary, 
let her drift up stern first with the tide, silent and invisible in the impenetrable darkness and in the dumb stillness. It was a long job, and when at the end of two hours Davidson thought he must be up to the clearing, the settlement slept already, the whole land of forests and rivers was asleep. Davidson, seeing a solitary light in the massed darkness of the shore, knew that it was burning in Bamps's house. This was unexpected at this time of the night, but convenient as a guide. By a turn of the screw and a touch of the helm, he sheared the sissy alongside Bamps's wharf, a miserable structure of a dozen piles and a few planks, of which the ex-vagabond was very proud. A couple of calashes jumped down on it, took a turn with the ropes thrown to them round the posts, and the sissy came to rest without a single loud word or the slightest noise, and just in time too, for the tide turned even before she was properly moored. Davidson had something to eat, and then, coming on deck for a last look round, noticed that the light was still burning in the house. This was very unusual, but since they were awake so late, Davidson thought that he would go up to say that he was in a hurry to be off, and to ask that what rattans there were in store should be sent on board with the first sign of dawn. He stepped carefully over the shaky planks, not being anxious to get a sprained ankle, and picked his way across the waste ground to the foot of the house ladder. The house was but a glorified hut on piles, unfenced and lonely. Like many a stout man, Davidson is very light-footed. He climbed the seven steps or so, stepped across the bamboo platform quietly, but what he saw through the doorway stopped him short. Four men were sitting by the light of a solitary candle. There was a bottle, a jug and glasses on the table, but they were not engaged in drinking. Two packs of cards were lying there too, but they were not preparing to play. They were talking together in whispers and remained quite unaware of him. He himself was too astonished to make a sound for some time. The world was still, except for the sibilation of the whispering heads bunched together over the table. And Davidson, as I have quoted him to you before, didn't like it. He didn't like it at all. The situation ended with a scream proceeding from the dark interior part of the room. Oh, Davy, you've given me a turn. Davidson made out beyond the table Anne's very pale face. She laughed a little hysterically out of the deep shadows between the gloomy mat walls. Ha, ha, ha. The four heads sprang apart at the first sound and four pairs of eyes became fixed stonily on Davidson. The woman came forward, having little more on her than a loose chintz wrapper and straw slippers on her bare feet. Her head was tied up Malay fashion in a red handkerchief, with a mass of loose hair hanging under it behind. Her professional gay European feathers had literally dropped off her in the course of these two years, but a long necklace of amber beads hung round her uncovered neck. It was the only ornament she had left. Bamps had sold all her poor enough trinkets during the flight from Saigon, when their association began. She came forward, past the table, into the light, with her usual groping gesture of extended arms, as though her soul, poor thing, had gone blind long ago, her white cheeks hollow, her eyes darkly wild, distracted as Davidson thought. She came on swiftly, grabbed him by the arm, dragged him in. It's heaven itself that sends you tonight. My Tony's so bad. Come and see him. Come along, do. Davidson submitted. The only one of the men to move was Bamps, who made as if to get up, but dropped back in his chair again. Davidson, in passing, heard him mutter confusedly something that sounded like, poor little beggar. The child, lying very flushed in a miserable cot, knocked up out of gin cases, stared at Davidson with wide, drowsy eyes. It was a bad bout of fever, clearly, but while Davidson was promising to go on board and fetch some medicines, and generally trying to say reassuring things, he could not help being struck by the extraordinary manner of the woman standing by his side, gazing with despairing expression down at the cot. She would suddenly throw a quick, startled glance at Davidson, and then towards the other room. Yes, my poor girl, he whispered, interpreting her distraction in his own way, though he had nothing precise in his mind. I'm afraid this bodes no good to you. 
How is it they are here? She seized his forearm and breathed out forcibly, No good to me. Oh, no. But what about you? They are after the dollars you have on board. Davidson let out an astonished, How do they know there are any dollars? She clapped her hands lightly in distress. So it's true. You have them on board. Then look out for yourself. They stood gazing down at the boy in the cot, aware that they might be observed from the other room. We must get him to perspire as soon as possible, said Davidson in his ordinary voice. You'll have to give him hot drink of some kind. I will go on board and bring you a spirit kettle, amongst other things. And he added under his breath, Do they actually mean murder? She made no sign. She had returned to her desolate contemplation of the boy. Davidson thought she had not heard him even, when, with an unchanged expression, she spoke under her breath. The Frenchman would in a minute. The others shirk it. Unless you resist. He's a devil. He keeps them going. Without him, they would have done nothing but talk. I've got chummy with him. What can you do when you are with a man like the fellow I am with now? Bamps is terrified of them, and they know it. He's in it from funk. Oh, Davy, take your ship away, quick. Too late, said Davidson. She's on the mud already. If the kid hadn't been in this state, I would have run off with him, to you, into the woods, anywhere. Oh, Davy, will he die? she cried aloud suddenly. Davidson met three men in the doorway. They made way for him without actually daring to face his glance. But Bamps was the only one who looked down with an air of guilt. The big Frenchman had remained lolling in his chair. He kept his stumps in his pockets and addressed Davidson. Isn't it unfortunate about that child? The distress of that woman there upsets me. But I am of no use in the world. I couldn't smooth the sick pillow of my dearest friend. I have no hands. Would you mind sticking one of those cigarettes there into the mouth of a poor harmless cripple? My nerves want soothing. Upon my honour they do. Davidson complied with his naturally kind smile. As his outward placidity becomes only more pronounced, if possible, the more reason there is for excitement, and as Davidson's eyes, when his wits are hard at work, get very still, and as if sleepy, the huge Frenchman might have been justified in concluding that the man there was a mere sheep, a sheep ready for slaughter. With Amercy Bien, he uplifted his huge carcass to reach the light of the candle with his cigarette, and Davidson left the house. Going down to the ship and returning, he had time to consider his position. At first he was inclined to believe that these men, Niklaus, the white Nakoda, was the only one he knew by sight before, besides Bamps, were not of the stamp to proceed to extremities. This was partly the reason why he never attempted to take any measures on board. His pacific calashes were not to be thought of as against white men. His wretched engineer would have had a fit from fright at the mere idea of any sort of combat. Davidson knew that he would have to depend on himself in this affair if it ever came off. Davidson underestimated naturally the driving power of the Frenchman's character and the force of the actuating motive. To that man, so hopelessly crippled these dollars were an enormous opportunity. With his share of the robbery, he would open another shop in Vladivostok, Haiphong, Manila, somewhere far away. Neither did it occur to Davidson who is a man of courage, if ever there was one, that his psychology was not known to the world at large, and that to this particular lot of ruffians, who judged him by his appearance, he appeared an unsuspicious, inoffensive, soft creature, as he passed again through the room, his hands full of various objects and parcels destined for the sick boy. All the four were sitting again round the table. Bamps not having the pluck to open his mouth, it was Niklaus, who, as a collective voice, called out to him thickly to come out soon and join in a drink. I think I'll have to stay some little time in there, to help her look after the boy, Davidson answered without stopping. This was a good thing to say to allay a possible suspicion, and, as it was, Davidson felt he must not stay very long. He sat down on an old empty nail keg near the improvised cot and looked at the child, while laughing Anne, moving to and fro, preparing the hot drink, giving it to the boy in spoonfuls, 
or stopping to gaze motionless at the flushed face, whispered disjointed bits of information. She had succeeded in making friends with that French devil. Davy would understand that she knew how to make herself pleasant to a man. And Davidson nodded without looking at her. The big beast had got to be quite confidential with her. She held his cards for him when they were having a game. Bamps. Oh, Bamps in his funk was only too glad to see the Frenchman humoured. And the Frenchman had come to believe that she was a woman who didn't care what she did. That's how it came about they got to talk before her openly. For a long time, she could not make out what game they were up to. The new arrivals, not expecting to find a woman with bumps, had been very startled and annoyed at first, she explained. She busied herself in attending to the boy, and nobody looking into that room would have seen anything suspicious in those two people exchanging murmurs by the sick bedside. But now they think I am a better man than Bamps ever was, she said with a faint laugh. The child moaned. She went down on her knees and, bending low, contemplated him mournfully. Then, raising her head, she asked Davidson whether he thought the child would get better. Davidson was sure of it. She murmured sadly, Poor kid. There's nothing in life for such as he, not a dog's chance. But I couldn't let him go, Davy. I couldn't. Davidson felt a profound pity for the child. She laid her hand on his knee and whispered an earnest warning against the Frenchman. Davy must never let him come to close quarters. Naturally, Davidson wanted to know the reason, for a man without hands did not strike him as very formidable under any circumstances. Mind you don't let him, that's all, she insisted anxiously, hesitated, and then confessed that the Frenchman had got her away from the others that afternoon and had ordered her to tie a seven-pound iron weight, out of the set of weights Bamps used in business, to his right stump. She had to do it for him. She had been afraid of his savage temper. Bamps was such a craven, and neither of the other men would have cared what happened to her. The Frenchman, however, with many awful threats, had warned her not to let the others know what she had done for him. Afterwards, he had been trying to cajole her. He had promised her that if she stood by him faithfully in this business, he would take her with him to Haiphong or some other place. A poor cripple needed somebody to take care of him. Always. Davidson asked her again if they really meant mischief. It was, he told me, the hardest thing to believe he had run up against, as yet, in his life. Anne nodded. The Frenchman's heart was set on this robbery. Davy might expect them, about midnight, creeping on board his ship, to steal anyhow, to murder perhaps. Her voice sounded weary, and her eyes remained fastened on her child. And still Davidson could not accept it somehow. His contempt for these men was too great. Look here, Davy, she said. I'll go outside with them when they start, and it will be hard luck if I don't find something to laugh at. They are used to that from me. Laugh or cry, what's the odds? You will be able to hear me on board on this quiet night. Dark it is too. Oh, it's dark, Davy. It's dark. Don't you run any risks, said Davidson. Presently he called her attention to the boy, who, less flushed now, had dropped into a sound sleep. Look, he'll be all right. She made as if to snatch the child up to her breast, but restrained herself. Davidson prepared to go. She whispered hurriedly, Mind, Davy, I've told them that you generally sleep aft in the hammock, under the awning over the cabin. They have been asking me about your ways, and about your ship too. I told them all I knew. I had to keep in with them, and Bamps would have told them if I hadn't. You understand? He made a friendly sign and went out. The men about the table, except Bamps, looked at him. This time it was Fector who spoke. Won't you join us in a quiet game, Captain? Davidson said that now the child was better, he thought he would go on board and turn in. Fector was the only one of the four whom he had, so to speak, never seen for he had had a good look at the Frenchman already. He observed Fector's muddy eyes, his mean, bitter mouth. Davidson's contempt for those men rose in his gorge, while his placid smile, his gentle tones and general air of innocence put heart into them. They exchanged meaning glances. We shall be sitting late over the cards, Fector said in his harsh, low voice. Don't make more noise than you can help. 
Oh, we are a quiet lot, and if the invalid shouldn't be so well, she will be sure to send one of us down to call you, so that you may play the doctor again, so don't shoot at sight. He isn't a shooting man, struck in Niklaus. I never shoot before making sure there's a reason for it. At any rate, said Davidson. Bamps let out a sickly snigger. The Frenchman alone got up to make a bow to Davidson's careless nod. His stumps were stuck immovably in his pockets. Davidson understood now the reason. He went down to the ship. His wits were working actively, and he was thoroughly angry. He smiled. He says, it must have been the first grim smile of his life, at the thought of the seven-pound weight lashed to the end of the Frenchman's stump. The ruffian had taken that precaution in case of a quarrel that might arise over the division of the spoil. A man with an unsuspected power to deal killing blows could take his own part in a sudden scrimmage round a heap of money, even against adversaries armed with revolvers, especially if he himself started the row. He's ready to face any of his friends with that thing, but he will have no use for it. There will be no occasion to quarrel about these dollars here, thought Davidson, getting on board quietly. He never paused to look if there was anybody about the decks. As a matter of fact, most of his crew were on shore, and the rest slept, stowed away in dark corners. He had his plan, and he went to work methodically. He fetched a lot of clothing from below and disposed it in his hammock in such a way as to distend it to the shape of a human body. Then he threw over all the light cotton sheet he used to draw over himself when sleeping on deck. Having done this, he loaded his two revolvers and clambered into one of the boats the sissy carried right aft, swung out on their davits. Then he waited, and again the doubt of such a thing happening to him crept into his mind. He was almost ashamed of this ridiculous vigil in a boat. He became bored, and then he became drowsy. The stillness of the black universe wearied him. There was not even the lapping of the water to keep him company, for the tide was out, and the sissy was lying on soft mud. Suddenly in the breathless, soundless, hot night, an Argus pheasant screamed in the woods across the stream. Davidson started violently, all his senses on the alert at once. The candle was still burning in the house. Everything was quiet again, but Davidson felt drowsy no longer. An uneasy premonition of evil oppressed him. Surely I am not afraid, he argued with himself. The silence was like a seal on his ears, and his nervous inward impatience grew intolerable. He commanded himself to keep still. But all the same, he was just going to jump out of the boat when a faint ripple on the immensity of silence, a mere tremor in the air, the ghost of a silvery laugh, reached his ears. Illusion! He kept very still. He had no difficulty now in emulating the stillness of the mouse, a grimly determined mouse. But he could not shake off that premonition of evil, unrelated to the mere danger of the situation. Nothing happened. It had been an illusion. A curiosity came to him to learn how they would go to work. He wondered and wondered, till the whole thing seemed more absurd than ever. He had left the hanging lamp in the cabin, burning as usual. It was part of his plan that everything should be as usual. Suddenly, in the dim glow of the skylight panes, a bulky shadow came up the ladder without a sound, made two steps towards the hammock. It hung right over the skylight and stood motionless. The Frenchman. The minutes began to slip away. Davidson guessed that the Frenchman's part, the poor cripple, was to watch his, Davidson's, slumbers, while the others were no doubt in the cabin busy forcing off the lazarette hatch. What was the course they meant to pursue once they got hold of the silver? There were ten cases, and each could be carried easily by two men. Nobody can tell now. But so far, Davidson was right. They were in the cabin. He expected to hear the sounds of breaking in every moment. But the fact was that one of them, perhaps Fector, who had stolen papers out of desks in his time, knew how to pick a lock and apparently was provided with the tools. Thus, while Davidson expected every moment to hear them begin down there, they had the bar off already and two cases actually up in the cabin out of the lazarette. In the diffused faint glow of the skylight, the Frenchman moved no more than a statue. Davidson could have shot him with the greatest ease, 
but he was not homicidally inclined. Moreover, he wanted to make sure before opening fire that the others had gone to work. Not hearing the sounds he expected to hear, he felt uncertain whether they all were on board yet. While he listened, the Frenchman, whose immobility might have but cloaked an internal struggle, moved forward a pace, then another. Davidson, entranced, watched him advance one leg, withdraw his right stump, the armed one, out of his pocket, and swinging his body to put greater force into the blow, bring the seven-pound weight down on the hammock, where the head of the sleeper ought to have been. Davidson admitted to me that his hair stirred at the roots then, but for Anne, his unsuspecting head would have been there. The Frenchman's surprise must have been simply overwhelming. He staggered away from the lightly swinging hammock, and before Davidson could make a movement, he had vanished. Bounding down the ladder to warn and alarm the other fellows, Davidson sprang instantly out of the boat, threw up the skylight flap, and had a glimpse of the men down there crouching round the hatch. They looked up scared, and at that moment, the Frenchman outside the door bellowed out, Trahesson, Trahesson. They bolted out of the cabin, falling over each other and swearing awfully. The shot Davidson let off down the skylight had hit no one, but he ran to the edge of the cabin top and at once opened fire at the dark shapes rushing about the deck. These shots were returned and a rapid fusillade burst out. Reports and flashes, Davidson dodging behind a ventilator and pulling the trigger till his revolver clicked and then throwing it down to take the other in his right hand. He had been hearing in the din the Frenchman's infuriated yells, Twesley, Twesley, above the fierce cursing of the others. But though they fired at him, they were only thinking of clearing out. In the flashes of the last shots, Davidson saw them scrambling over the rail. That he had hit more than one, he was certain. Two different voices had cried out in pain, but apparently none of them were disabled. Davidson leaned against the bulwark, reloading his revolver without haste. He had not the slightest apprehension of their coming back. On the other hand, he had no intention of pursuing them on shore in the dark. What they were doing, he had no idea. Looking to their hurts, probably. Not very far from the bank, the invisible Frenchman was blaspheming and cursing his associates, his luck, and all the world. He ceased. Then, with a sudden vengeful yell, It's that woman. It's that woman that has sold us was heard running off in the night. Davidson caught his breath in a sudden pang of remorse. He perceived with dismay that the stratagem of his defence had given Anne away. He did not hesitate a moment. It was for him to save her now. He leaped ashore. But even as he landed on the wharf, he heard a shrill shriek which pierced his very soul. The light was still burning in the house. Davidson, revolver in hand, was making for it. When another shriek, away to his left, made him change his direction. He changed his direction, but very soon he stopped. It was then that he hesitated in cruel perplexity. He guessed what had happened. The woman had managed to escape from the house in some way and now was being chased in the open by the infuriated Frenchman. He trusted she would try to run on board for protection. All was still around Davidson. Whether she had run on board or not, this silence meant that the Frenchman had lost her in the dark. Davidson, relieved, but still very anxious, turned towards the riverside. He had not made two steps in that direction when another shriek burst out behind him, again close to the house. He thinks that the Frenchman had lost sight of the poor woman right enough. Then came that period of silence. But the horrible ruffian had not given up his murderous purpose. He reasoned that she would try to steal back to her child and went to lie in wait for her near the house. It must have been something like that. As she entered the light falling about the house ladder, he had rushed at her too soon, impatient for vengeance. She had let out that second scream of mortal fear when she caught sight of him and turned to run for life again. This time she was making for the river, but not in a straight line. Her shrieks circled about Davidson. He turned on his heels, following the horrible trail of sound in the darkness. He wanted to shout, This way, Anne, I am here. But he couldn't. At the horror of this chase, more ghastly in his imagination than if he could have seen it, 
the perspiration broke out on his forehead while his throat was as dry as tinder. A last supreme scream was cut short suddenly. The silence which ensued was even more dreadful. Davidson felt sick. He tore his feet from the spot and walked straight before him, gripping the revolver and peering into the obscurity fearfully. Suddenly a bulky shape sprang from the ground within a few yards of him and bounded away. Instinctively he fired at it, started to run in pursuit, and stumbled against something soft which threw him down headlong. Even as he pitched forward on his head he knew it could be nothing else but laughing Anne's body. He picked himself up and remaining on his knees tried to lift her in his arms. He felt her so limp that he gave it up. She was lying on her face, her long hair scattered on the ground. Some of it was wet. Davidson, feeling about her head, came to a place where the crushed bone gave way under his fingers. But even before that discovery, he knew that she was dead. The pursuing Frenchman had flung her down with a kick from behind, and, squatting on her back, was battering in her skull with the weight she herself had fastened to his stump. When the totally unexpected Davidson loomed up in the night and scared him away. Davidson, kneeling by the side of that woman done so miserably to death, was overcome by remorse. She had died for him. His manhood was as if stunned. For the first time he felt afraid. He might have been pounced upon in the dark at any moment by the murderer of Laughing Anne. He confesses to the impulse of creeping away from that pitiful corpse on his hands and knees to the refuge of the ship. He even says that he actually began to do so. One can hardly picture to oneself Davidson crawling away on all fours from the murdered woman, Davidson unmanned and crushed by the idea that she had died for him in a sense. But he could not have gone very far. What stopped him was the thought of the boy, laughing Anne's child, that, Davidson remembered her very words, would not have a dog's chance. This life the woman had left behind her appeared to Davidson's conscience in the light of a sacred trust. He assumed an erect attitude and, quaking inwardly still, turned about and walked towards the house. For all his tremors, he was very determined, but that smashed skull had affected his imagination and he felt very defenceless in the darkness in which he seemed to hear faintly now here, now there, the prowling footsteps of the murderer without hands. But he never faltered in his purpose. He got away with the boy safely after all. The house he found empty. A profound silence encompassed him all the time, except once, just as he got down the ladder with Tony in his arms. When a faint groan reached his ears, it seemed to come from the pitch-black space between the posts on which the house was built. But he did not stop to investigate. It's no use telling you in detail how Davidson got on board with the burden Anne's miserably cruel fate had thrust into his arms. How next morning, his scared crew, after observing from a distance the state of affairs on board, rejoined with alacrity. How Davidson went ashore and aided by his engineer, still half dead with fright, rolled up laughing Anne's body in a cotton sheet and brought it on board for burial at sea later. While busy with this pious task, Davidson, glancing about, perceived a huge heap of white clothes huddled up against the corner post of the house. That it was the Frenchman lying there, he could not doubt. Taking it in connection with the dismal groan he had heard in the night, Davidson is pretty sure that his random shot gave a mortal hurt to the murderer of poor Anne. As to the others, Davidson never set eyes on a single one of them. Whether they had concealed themselves in the scared settlement, or bolted into the forest, or were hiding on board Niklaus's prow, which could be seen lying on the mud a hundred yards or so higher up the creek. The fact is that they vanished, and Davidson did not trouble his head about them. He lost no time in getting out of the creek, directly the sissy floated. After steaming some twenty miles clear of the coast, he, in his own words, committed the body to the deep. He did everything himself. He weighted her down with a few fire bars. He read the service. He lifted the plank. He was the only mourner. And while he was rendering these last services to the dead, the desolation of that life and the atrocious wretchedness of its end cried aloud to his compassion. 
whispered to him in tones of self-reproach. He ought to have handled the warning she had given him in another way. He was convinced now that a simple display of watchfulness would have been enough to restrain that vile and cowardly crew. But the fact was that he had not quite believed that anything would be attempted. The body of Laughing Anne, having been committed to the deep some twenty miles SSW from Cape Selatan, the task before Davidson was to commit Laughing Anne's child to the care of his wife. And there, poor good Davidson made a fatal move. He didn't want to tell her the whole awful story, since it involved the knowledge of the danger from which he, Davidson, had escaped. And this, too, after he had been laughing at her unreasonable fears only a short time before. I thought that if I told her everything, Davidson explained to me, she would never have a moment's peace while I was away on my trips. He simply stated that the boy was an orphan, the child of some people to whom he, Davidson, was under the greatest obligation, and that he felt morally bound to look after him. Some day he would tell her more, he said, and meantime he trusted in the goodness and warmth of her heart, in her woman's natural compassion. He did not know that her heart was about the size of a parched pea, and had the proportional amount of warmth, and that her faculty of compassion was mainly directed to herself. He was only startled and disappointed at the air of cold surprise and the suspicious look with which she received his imperfect tale. But she did not say much. She never had much to say. She was a fool of the silent, hopeless kind. What story Davidson's crew thought fit to set afloat in Malay town is neither here nor there. Davidson himself took some of his friends into his confidence, besides giving the full story officially to the harbour master. The harbour master was considerably astonished. He didn't think, however, that a formal complaint should be made to the Dutch government. They would probably do nothing in the end after a lot of trouble and correspondence. The robbery had not come off after all. Those vagabonds could be trusted to go to the devil in their own way. No amount of fuss would bring the poor woman to life again, and the actual murderer had been done justice to by a chance shot from Davidson. Better let the matter drop. This was good common sense, but he was impressed. Sounds a terrible affair, Captain Davidson. Aye, terrible enough, agreed the remorseful Davidson. But the most terrible thing for him, though he didn't know it yet then, was that his wife's silly brain was slowly coming to the conclusion that Tony was Davidson's child, and that he had invented that lame story to introduce him into her pure home in defiance of decency, of virtue, of her most sacred feelings. Davidson was aware of some constraint in his domestic relations, but at the best of times she was not demonstrative, and perhaps that very coldness was part of her charm in the placid Davidson's eyes. Women are loved for all sorts of reasons and even for characteristics which one would think repellent. She was watching him and nursing her suspicions. Then one day, monkey-faced Richie called on that sweet, shy Mrs. Davidson. She had come out under his care and he considered himself a privileged person, her oldest friend in the tropics. He posed for a great admirer of hers. He was always a great chatterer. He had got hold of the story rather vaguely and he started chattering on that subject, thinking she knew all about it. And in due course, he let out something about Laughing Anne. Laughing Anne, says Mrs. Davidson with a start. What's that? Richie plunged into circumlocution at once, but she very soon stopped him. Is that creature dead? she asks. I believe so, stammered Richie. Your husband says so. But you don't know for certain? No. How could I, Mrs. Davidson? That's all wanted to know, says she, and goes out of the room. When Davidson came home, she was ready to go for him. Not with common voluble indignation, but as if trickling a stream of cold, clear water down his back. She talked of his base intrigue, with a vile woman, of being made a fool of, of the insult to her dignity. Davidson begged her to listen to him and told her all the story, thinking that it would move a heart of stone. He tried to make her understand his remorse. She heard him to the end, said indeed, and turned her back on him. Don't you believe me? he asked, appalled. She didn't say yes or no. All she said was, send that brat away at once. 
I can't throw him out into the street, cried Davidson. You don't mean it. I don't care. There are charitable institutions for such children, I suppose. That I will never do, said Davidson. Very well. That's enough for me. Davidson's home after this was like a silent, frozen hell for him. A stupid woman with a sense of grievance is worse than an unchained devil. He sent the boy to the White Fathers in Malacca. This was not a very expensive sort of education, but she could not forgive him for not casting the offensive child away utterly. She worked up her sense of her wifely wrongs and of her injured purity to such a pitch that one day, when poor Davidson was pleading with her to be reasonable and not to make an impossible existence for them both, she turned on him in a chill passion and told him that his very sight was odious to her. Davidson, with his scrupulous delicacy of feeling, was not the man to assert his rights over a woman who could not bear the sight of him. He bowed his head and shortly afterwards arranged for her to go back to her parents. That was exactly what she wanted in her outraged dignity, and then she had always disliked the tropics and had detested secretly the people she had to live amongst as Davidson's wife. She took her pure, sensitive, mean little soul away to Fremantle or somewhere in that direction, and of course the little girl went away with her too. What could poor Davidson have done with a little girl on his hands, even if she had consented to leave her with him? which is unthinkable. This is the story that has spoiled Davidson's smile for him, which perhaps it wouldn't have done so thoroughly had he been less of a good fellow. Hollis ceased. But before we rose from the table, I asked him if he knew what had become of Laughing Anne's boy. He counted carefully the change handed him by the Chinaman waiter and raised his head. Oh, that's the finishing touch. He was a bright, taking little chap, as you know, and the fathers took very special pains in his bringing up. Davidson expected in his heart to have some comfort out of him. In his placid way, he's a man who needs affection. Well, Tony has grown into a fine youth, but there you are. He wants to be a priest. His one dream is to be a missionary. The fathers assure Davidson that it is a serious vocation. They tell him he has a special disposition for mission work too. So laughing Anne's boy will lead a saintly life in China somewhere. He may even become a martyr, but poor Davidson is left out in the cold. He will have to go downhill without a single human affection near him because of these old dollars.